Hey guys, it's Matt. This is a fun exercise that makes a mockery of world history and United States history as it's been presented to us. This is, in my opinion, not a 1.25 exercise that's just meant to be gotten through to collect some information. It is to be enjoyed, probably better listened to at night. If you have a beer or two or a glass of wine, or if you're driving, or if you're Jupiter Jones cleaning toilets and Jupiter ascending, it's, it's that type of presentation. Most of you will know most of this, the people here, of course, but I'll, I'll, I'll get you thinking. And if nothing else, I will make a mockery. <laughs> I'll make a mockery of this, of this ridiculous history that they ask us to believe. And of course, like for example, my favorite part will come up about the Ginga C-O-N and the, the Kublai C-O-N, the Khan. Uh, it's a joke. It's an absolute joke that these guys in tents herding reindeer could take over a third of the Earth's landmass. An absolute joke. So I think we'll get into that. Things you've already heard, but I guarantee I'll do it in a little bit different way. Get you thinking and probably get you laughing a few times as well. Not a 1.25 exercise. Kick your feet back. More like the radio show. Kick your feet back. Smoke them if you got them. And before I start, I just want to do a quick extemporaneous preface or preface, because where do you start? All of history has been presented is a fraud. As you work out from your heart center reality, well, the big concepts, the concepts that come from the highest levels of the screen, we know it's all a fraud. So I started a certain point in time, roughly 3,000 years ago, but you could take this back even farther. You could take the fraud back right to the Big Bang, which never happened which is an absolute joke. Consciousness came first. You could take it right back to the moment they tell you that some little fishy crawled up onto the sand and he says, come on, guys, we're tired of this water. Let's go up here. The problem is there's no food up there. The first poor little bastard that crawled up would have seen there ain't no food up here and he would have crawled back down and never gone back up again. Darwin is the biggest joke of fraud deception of all time. But of course, the way they do business, truth is always mixed with fraud. There are certain elements of natural selection from Darwin that are absolutely legitimate and real. The fastest cheetahs were able to get away. Therefore, the fastest cheetahs were able to reproduce, therefore making faster cheetahs. The giraffes that had a little bit longer necks were able to eat in the drought, when the giraffes with the shorter necks couldn't, the giraffes with shorter necks were not able to reproduce, and therefore giraffes got longer necks. This is just basic natural selection. It's not much more complicated than a botanist breeding the prettiest flower with the prettiest flower and not breeding the flowers that look like they were grown on the other side of the wall at Chernobyl. It, this, this could happen in just a generation or two. This is, these are simple principles, but you combine these principles into Darwin, all the stuff that makes sense is put in the same sandwich as the fraud, and it's all believed. Just how they do business, these creeps. So with that being the end of the preface, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, I would like to apologize to the dead. I would like to apologize to the dead of history for making fun of the circumstances that I will do that led to their death. Okay, I'm sorry. However, I'm somewhat confident that you, the dead, I'm speaking to the dead now, would be fine with any method or means that leads to the truth regarding the circumstances that caused their death to come out. So I'm going to make fun of it, but I think ultimately the dead want the truth is what I'm saying. Now, you dead had no way of knowing that in almost all cases you were simply pawns carrying out the will of some sick puppet master somewhere. But you dead must rest. You must stop rolling in your graves. And we truthers will help you do that by bringing forth the truth. You see this rolling over in your grave thing that people poke fun of? Oh, he's rolling over in his grave. It's real. It, it's re They roll over in their grave. This thing is done by the dead whose ghosts realize that the history that surrounds their death 
or the circumstances that put him on that battlefield where the creeps were playing both sides or whatever they were led into. The circumstances around their death, what put them there as a pawn, was fraudulent. So they roll and they spin in their grave. It's, re- it's real. For example, a few billion people think that 19 guys, 19 guys with the true value box cutters, a uh, few billion people think that's what happened, and that's that's what did it. For those psychics out there that commune with the dead, you know, let me know. But I'm just kind of thinking that they would want the truth to come out ultimately, even if I have to make jokes or make fun of it to bring the truth out. But if you commune with the dead and that's not what the dead would want, let me know, and I'll, I won't do this again. And my final appeal to the dead is this. I want to apologize in case I got anything wrong. I want to apologize in case my interpretation of history is actually incorrect. And that's the one page out of a thousand page history book that's actually correct. Or somewhere down the line, those fighting and died were actually fighting for a just cause that I'm misinterpreting. And it wasn't just to line the pockets of some banker or worse, to feed these Dracula stand-ins who put soldiers on a battlefield for more than money, for sick, energetic reasons, or blood sacrifice reasons, or whatever reason a young man was told to go off and fight for some banker. I'm not making fun of the dead in doing this. I'm going to make fun of these situations, but this is a sincere apology. This is no joke. Okay. You remember the scene in the movie Goodwill Hunting when Goodwill says to that guy, a Mork from Ork, Goodwill Hunting, Matt Damon says to Mork from Ork, you ever read Howard Zinn's History of the United States Part 1? Or whatever it's called? Let me see what it's called. I'll be right back. Let me, let me go look it up. No, that's like Mel Brooks' History of the World Part 1. That's the Mel Brooks thing. It's Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. See, the a People's, this is so communist, so socialist. And by the way, Guys, when you go to – not hopefully anybody would buy that, that, that piece of crap on Amazon. But if you go to buy it, Howard Zinn, all, name in all caps. But if you look at the image, I believe I just saw it on Wikipedia, the name Howard Zinn, all lowercase on that version. Everything else in the title looks exactly the same, all lowercase. The current version is what's sold on Amazon, all caps. I wonder if uh, Howard Zinn is deceased, but I wonder – if um, maybe he got on the wrong side of the puppeteers and they they had taken his sovereignty away, he could present his name in all lowercase and they put it back to all caps to doom him to hell. So sorry, back to what I was saying. In the movie, Goodwill says to Mork from Mork, you ever read Howard's into People's History of the United States? That book will knock your socks off. I'm from Southie. So look, Zinn obviously presents U.S. history in a slightly different light than, of course, the ninth grade textbook does or what we learned if you're over age 35. But Zinn, you know, he's going to give you the truth, right? It's still BS. You know, the liberal intellectuals love to believe that, of course, there's just a tiny bit of history that's held back. The liberals like to believe that. The truthers like to believe that. But see, we're going to get closer, a lot closer to the truth. The liberals will still be fooled and stay on their farms. But in the case of Howard Zinn, so no, this is real history. And that's why Goodwill says, you ever read a people's history of the United States? How do I just go from a Boston accent to, a, to some deranged South Carolina accent? I'm going to stop that. Sorry. Howard Zinn is a classic animal farm, graduated animal farm. But this one is for liberals. You know, they want certain groups to think that significant portions of history or a bit here or a bit there – is askew, held back, not really delivered to the American people through regular sources, and a lot of it's covered up. And you have to be a real Ivy League jerk to get to the bottom of it. That's what the Howard Zinn at People's History United States is for. Liberal farms like Howard Zinn exist just like conservative graduated animal farms exist. They, here's the real truth. Come over here. Oh, come over here. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're a highly educated uh, Ivy League jerk and you read the Atlantic magazine. Oh, you're welcome over here. Yeah, here here's a real history. And then people, th- okay, they get uh, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States in their hands. And, yum, 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 yum. Oh, this is a real deal. It's just a farm. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a farm to keep you satisfied. And speaking of Zinn, I once went to a Zinn's diner. 
literally just outside of Intercourse, PA. I'm not joking. There's a town's called Intercourse, PA, Zinn's Diner. It's a few miles from Blue Ball. I'm not kidding. Look it up. It's up by Effort in Lancaster. But I don't mean to imply that diner was somehow associated with Howard Zinn. It's probably like an Amish name. That's, that's Pennsylvania Dutch Amish country up there, Zinn. The presentation of the Amish in the Harrison Ford movie Witness – Witness is inc- it's first of all Witness is an incredibly good movie, but the presentation of the Amish is absolutely realistic. Um, my grandmother lived in Morgantown, just a few miles. They come and go from her house all the time. You have Amish Mennonites, so um, Zinn probably an Amish name, but half the names up there, like in the movie Witness presents, half are Laps, half are Stoltzfuses. Eli, La- there's like forty thousand Eli Laps. Remember the movie Rachel. Um, who was dating Tom Cruise in that movie about play- she went she went from the highest of high tech consulting <laughs> consulting on the performance of of f fourteens with Maverick and Goose to the lowest of low tech to playing Rachel who didn't even have electricity and running water now that's a impressive feat Kelly McGillis playing roles that far apart from each other on different ends of the spectrum okay now this power structure wherever the creeps like to meet around Cuomo Lake. Is that Cuomo? They named a lake in Italy around Governor Cuomo. They know that tiny lies are easily seen by people. Tiny little manipulations trying to get away with this and that. It's easily seen. We're all set up to see that. But lies too massive to comprehend go right by most people. Make the lie as large as possible and people won't, first of all, won't even see it because it's too big. And second, if they do start to sense it, they won't believe that that level of manipulation would be possible just by good people in government working for us. So nobody can ever realize they're sleeping on King Kong's back if they're sleeping on King Kong's back. But they'll notice a tiny little wine spot on a throw rug. Like in Risky Business, Joel's dad, Tom Cruise's dad, will notice, Joel, do you detect a preponderance of bass? He'll detect bass in his stereo. Although Joel had the bass pretty much cranked up, but you know what I mean. He'll, he'll find the little things Joel does. But what this reality does, the game this reality plays, is in this example, the Joel Goodson example, it invites in Metallica, the band Metallica, to live with Joel. And when Joel's dad and mom come back from that trip, Joel just says, this band dad has always been here. What you, it's always been here. It's always been like this. This band here, um, Lars, whoever, Hat, Hatfield, they've been bunking in the rec room for years, Dad. What's the matter with you? And Joel's dad will just shake his head and ask what time dinner is. He must have missed something. The, the strangeness is so big that people just walk right by it. Not the greatest example, but it makes a point. The dumb examples sometimes stick in your head. However... If Joel has a party and he puts one little tiny, tiny, tiny crack in this egg, this ceramic egg that lights up, oh, dad and mom will notice that. If Metallica lives in the room next door, they won't notice that. The reality bastards know this is how human nature works. So trying to hide all the small stuff calls attention. Putting it right out in the open creates a situation where people don't see anything's wrong. Communism and capitalism created the same oligarchs. That control their respective fiefdoms. It's just that one side tells people how wonderful their situation is and how appreciative they should be of their opportunities surrounding their situation. And they can convince people on that side that anybody can be the next Obama. Anybody can be the next president of the United States coming out of the slums of Jakarta, Indonesia. Or anybody can be on this Forbes list if their website idea took off. To one side... The game is completely fair, and it's just the best a modern society t- can do. It's just that, you know, I'm sorry that you just didn't succeed. See, y- your idea wasn't as good as Zuck the Borg's idea. Zuck the Borg's idea was better than your stupid idea. You created a website called Sideboob. Yeah, your website was called Sideboob. And your idea was to capture and record with timestamps all movie cleavages shot from the side. There's most of it or half of it is J-Lo. Now, you dummies had the same opportunities in this 
beautiful capitalist system where there is no insider trading and no insider information or families get ahead or bloodlines get ahead. All you dummies had the same opportunity as Zuck the Borg, and you had the same opportunities as Jeff Bezos, one billion U.S. <laughs> Everybody's on a evil playing – evil. So there, there you go. That's him. Bet said a brilliant Freudian slip, an evil playing field, even playing field here. I tell you it's even, but it's evil <laughs> playing field. I tell you it's even. But not everybody is as smart as Dr. Evil or as Zuck the Borg. But this, this, this incredible capitalistic society, you could even use your physical gifts here to get ahead. And I don't mean the 1% of the 1% of the 1% that are going to be a professional athlete. I mean, look at Dirk Diggler. Marky Mark's presentation of Dirk Diggler and Boogie Nights, he used his physical gifts to go as far as he could go. If you didn't use yours, well, that's on you. But he had equal chance here. Zuck the Borg, he just had an idea and happened to be at the right place at the right time. Nobody was pushed to the forefront in an inorganic way or an unnatural way. Everybody's here making it on their own merit. I mean, when Facebook took off, it was just a coincidence, dude. A coincidence that the other two big ones just went away. So as soon as Facebook started to kick ass in 2004, 2005, oh, MySpace just went away. And Friendster just went away. It's just competition. And, of course, um, M Rupert Murdoch mismanaged MySpace. So there's real reasons that the dummies can believe why MySpace just couldn't keep up. It wasn't like they rigged it. So MySpace and Friendster would go away, and they actually took and rose one to prominence uh, in an inorganic way or an unnatural way. That would never happen here. Man, this is just regular old competition. There are no favors or certain uh, crony. There's no such thing as crony capitalism where, where one store like Home Depot is allowed to remain open and all the other little ones are shut down. That doesn't happen in America, dude. Come on now. Okay, so Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States is what you would call a historical, mini historical graduated animal farm. It's just a little historical pen meant to corral people who begin, mostly on the liberal side, who begin to question traditional U.S. history. And just the same concepts that were presented a long time ago about the graduated animal farms, people are kind of start to push back a little bit. And they went off the main ranch because the main ranch is too dumbed down for readers of the Atlantic magazine. And the main ranch or what's presented on CNN may be too dumbed down for readers of the Economist magazine. That's why the Economist magazine exists, to give you the same bullshit, but just in a higher level so people think they're really getting the truth and they can be satisfied when they look at their Ivy League diploma hanging on the wall. Just like with any animal farm, when the mini-me awakened get into Zen, they figure they've just found real truth. Oh, this here, this is, this is the real deal. And it's confirmed by that genius Matt Damon plays, Goodwill. He says, this book here really knock your socks off. You know, so that's see that's that's confirmed. That's what that's why that he dropped that line in the movie to Mork from Mork. So these liberals are quite satisfied with this particular farm. See, the farms on the liberal side, because liberalism is a mental disorder, are are different than the farms on the conservative side. The farmers making the conservative presentation are actually making a lot of sense and are delivering a lot of truth, but they're not getting you anywhere close to the truth of what you need to know for yourself to succeed in life as a real human being. They're giving you just more scraps off the end of the table, but at least the, the conservative farms make sense in the truth they present. The liberal farms are uh, just by definition psychotic, but there, there's, it's a different method they use on the liberal side, like um, the New York Times and the Atlantic Magazine and these publications and uh, The Economist and things like that. And they people sit back in the blue states with their feet up having breakfast. And isn't this Atlantic magazine wonderful? Soon we'll get laws passed that only allows one bullet per magazine. You remember what Governor Cuomo said, right? Our hero. He, he just got an award, I think, for what he did in New York State fighting the sea. Governor Cuomo says, nobody needs more than 10 bullets. To kill a deer! That, that's, see, it's psychotic it, that that man is literally a liberal hero. That What else do you need to know? 
But see, they're not just going to stop at getting magazines down to eight and clips down to six. They want one bullet per magazine. And then Massachusetts and California can then require all new firearms purchased in the state to actually go back to 1850 standards where you need paper blotter and it needs to be rammed. Each bullet needs to be rammed with black powder. Therefore, you only get one shot per 90 seconds as the rapist runs after you. Do you have any idea how hard it is to jam a bullet down the front of a gun with black powder as you're running for your life at full speed? It ain't easy. The guys in the front lines lining up against the redcoats, they were kind of they were either on a knee or stationary, jamming their pole down their their thing. You don't think California and, and Massachusetts wants to return to that? Oh, oh, they'll return to that, but they're they're bastions of free freedom. Gavin Newsom will tell you how free California is. We're liberal. Is, is based on, the root of the word is based on liberty. That's it's that's the, the inversion, the mockery. The the states that border on um, Stalin's communism use the word liberal, which stems from liberty. That everything in this reality is is an inverted, perverted nightmare. And they said, "Well, we're, we're all about freedom. Of course, a fourteen year old should be allowed to get the morning after pill or birth control without parent consent. We're all about freedom." But well, you, well, you're taking my guns away. I'm only allowed one bullet per magazine. Well, you don't. No, it's selective freedom. You don't get any freedom over here. You can't leave your house when we lock you in. You stay like Montreal. You stay home after eight o'clock. You go out. You go out to get yourself locks and bagels. It's eight thousand dollars. Sorry, Montreal's a four thousand dollar fine. We're all about liberalism. It's about freedom, man. Why well, can't I have my guns? No, you can't have that. You get the liberalism and the freedom that we want you to have. That's what freedom really is, man. So to close on Zinn and his little mini animal farm, graduated animal farm inside of liberalism, it's to round up any liberal dissenters who decide to question traditional history and to fool them into thinking that, no, this is, this is, this is the terminus of truth here. You know, come over to our ranch where the slop and the feed is better than the slop and the feed on the main farm. That's for the masses of chickens. You got an Ivy League diploma, man. You read Economist magazine in the Atlantic. You don't want to be in this main farm with all these chickens. They're idiots. Come over to our farm. Check out our slop and feed. Here's a copy of the People's History of the United States, which is a free gift when you come over to the new ranch. And if a super smart Matt Damon, who's playing a super genius in a movie, mentions Zinn in a positive light, all the better for the army of intellectuals to accept it as the terminus of truth. This is where it's at, man. That goodwill mentioning Zinn while getting in the face of that Jumanji guy just adds to Zinn's liberal credibility. Like a kid in high school journalism club, you know, getting Woodward and Bernstein in as guest speakers or show and tell. An asterisk in the margin here to complete this section, the fine print here, it says, um, Goodwill Hunting 2, the sequel. Uh, 1997 was Goodwill Hunting. It was supposed to be the sequel, Goodwill Hunting 2, set to be released on the 20 year anniversary, 2017. But Matt Damon was committed elsewhere and he couldn't do the sequel. Some speculate that the role was too challenging for Matt Damon, and they say the sequel, which is to be called Goodwill Bargain Hunting, Goodwill Bargain Hunting, Exploring the Thrift Shops of Southie, was too difficult a part for Damon, and he fled, agreeing to do another terrible Jason Bourne movie instead. That was quite a preface. In terms of the fake U.S. and world history, where should we start? You know, I can't really tell you what exactly is real? I wasn't there when Lincoln was handed the script for the Gettysburg Address. I can only kind of sit back and point out and call out bullshit and say what's not real, or at least with a high probability and percentage that it's not real, approaching 100%. So if you want a broad brush statement on what's not real, I'll say what's not real in terms of history is... Every single history book ever passed out to a hungover senior in college and high school. Every damn one on the telephone, every one. It's bull crap. And people be asking me back if they could talk to me. Well, what part of 
the history that was passed out to the hungover college or high school senior was incorrect. And I'd say back, all of it in some way or another. Not that there was no Civil War, but the Civil War is not what they say. It's not Santa Claus. It's not all or nothing. And people may say back, what makes you so special, man, to make such a statement like that, you jerk, you conspiracy theorist, son of a bitch? Because like Kevin Bacon said in Apollo 13, he said, how do I know? Because I can add. And my equivalent statement would be because I can apply a degree of common sense instead of just taking history of what they say it is and just bowing down to it. If you think about it for about 90 seconds, it doesn't add the F up. None of it does. Shit, man, you're going too far. How you know all this history is not correct? You admit you weren't there. You don't even know who faked it and why. Well, generally, I know who faked it, not the specifics, and I know why. But we'll talk about that in another video, just another distraction, creating a false sense of self that keeps you ultimately from who you are. But that's not the purpose of this video. How do I know? For the same reason I know Occupy Wall Street didn't paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I wasn't there when the ceiling was painted, and I wasn't in some some squalor tent in Occupy Wall Street. I wasn't at either one, but I know the Occupy Wall Street people didn't paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, right? Is that a stretch? I don't need to be there. For the same reason, I know Dirk Diggler and Chest Rockwell are not real names. Although the second guy, his name in the movie is actually Rothschild. <laughs> I, I kid you not. In Boogie Nights, his name's Rothschild. Boogie Nights. <laughs> when history... And all of reality, actually, for, the, for that matter, gets – but when history gets this absurd, you don't need to be in that little band of the time bandits. You don't need to be one of the time bandits to expose it. You don't need to be there. Brock Landers, I know, isn't real. I don't need to be there on set to know that. Since we really can't start the first time some fish flopped up onto the beach looking for – it's meal, maybe a giant steak or something. We can't start there. You know, it's all, who knows? It's so sketchy. And, um, you know, the only people that tries to pass that off is Darwin. And we, we have to be closer to modern history. So let's start with something really, really tiny, really small, inconsequential. Let's just start with the Great Pyramid. Nobody knows how they were built. And what's more, they couldn't be built today with giant caterpillar equipment. And you pull a fleet of bulldozers out of every... Chinese ghost city, pull every crane off of every Chinese abandoned apartment building in every Chinese ghost city, you still, all that equipment couldn't make the Great Pyramid. So you may disagree and argue with me that people today do, some people, Matt, do understand the building techniques that were used to build the Great Pyramid thousands of years ago. Somebody will say to me, every single Poison Ivy League university has an Egyptologist. They all have an Egyptologist. That's the study of Egypt, you jerk. And every major university, like the University of Indiana, has an archaeological professor, if not an Egyptologist. And surely, Matt, they know how the pyramids were built. Now, I agree it would make sense for a guy in Cambridge who makes about 400,000 quid a year and who calls himself on his business card an Egyptologist. That's like head futurist at Google, Kurzweil. You know, he, he puts that much stock into having this much knowledge. He should know. The head of the Department of Archaeology at the University of Michigan should actually know how the Great Pyramid was built. But he don't know. She don't know. These people know more about, in my opinion, TV repair and vacuum tubes than they really know how the darn thing was built. I don't care if they've written books on it. I don't care how many books they've published on the topic. doesn't mean it's right. doesn't mean I believe it. It's not hard to fill pages and say nothing. What if I wrote a series of books about my personal Hollywood starlet exploits? Oh, you don't know what I did in Los Angeles between 96 and 99. I had Hollywood starlet exploits. I was at that Playboy Mansion lots of times, man. What if I wrote a book about it because I lived in L.A. from 96 to 99? Would you believe it? Well, there's a book on it. Well, so what? Does it mean I really was with these starlets? Nope. On most nights in 96 and 99 in Los Angeles, I went to Blockbuster by myself. I'm not joking. I did that for three years. The people in the society who are so-called experts in their field know the least. They know the least because they carry the bias of being know-it-alls. 
see that if you put something down in a book, well, you better defend what's down in that book. You can't be like, oh yeah, what I just wrote in that book, man, just sold ten thousand copies. That's a piece of shit. I now change it all. I'm 179 degrees off that piece of shit. No, you got to defend that piece of shit. And the the box thinking around these know it alls gets tighter and tighter and tighter, like a head in a vice. The little letters that line up after their name on their business cards, that tells them how smart they are and assures them that they have the right to be know-it-alls. And then that even that diploma on the wall from the Poison Ivy League is a right to be a know-it-all. Egyptologists must be able to tell you how the pyramids were built or they risk their status in the university. And they always must act like they know everything or they risk their status in the university. They must put forth their bogus theories with confidence to justify their own worth. They will confidently believe their own BS because they have to look themselves in the mirror and feel worthy when they make love to their women, or in some case, if it's a woman Egyptologist, to make love to their man, both of which are considering changing sex. The rare, honest Egyptologist, that probably doesn't exist, but there's probably one somewhere in the world, they would deliver the real truth about Egypt, which is, we've studied it for 30 years. We have no friggin' idea. (laughs) That's what the book should be. One line of one page. The big problem these professors with tenure have is they don't even realize it, but they're thinking within the confines of a tiny little reality box. I'm now going to call ahead in a vice. When they see a kid ride through the sky on his bike in person, they, the kid literally just rode through the sky on his bike, they'll never allow themselves to think that the reason for it may be a little alien in a basket. They just don't put that shit together. If it can't be explained by academic means or the means available to them inside their little box or head in a vice, then it can't be right. Or it must be a delusion, or must be something from a conspiracy theorist, or maybe a bit of bad beef, perhaps like Scrooge used to explain away why Jacob Marley was sitting in his house in chains, a ghost of Jacob Marley. You might be a bit of bad beef. Is is really, really Scrooge? How come Jacob Marley is it really? Is this the typical symptom of a bit of bad beef sitting across a ghost covered in chains? I didn't realize that's a typical symptom for a bit of bad beef, Scrooge, you idiot. For the few rare academics who actually really want to think big or outside of the vice, they still will find themselves considering what type of thinking will be approved. Will this idea be approved by the university provost? What's a provost? Well, see what it comes down to is $250,000 a year, benefits packages, lots of time off, and just generally the academic, the quan. You know, Jerry Maguire, he had the quan, you have the respect, the coin, the love, everything. That's what these university professors have in their own academic areas. They have the academic quan. It's a lot to lose just for trying to think big and actually solve some problems. It's a lot easier just to parrot the existing narrative. So that the professor in a Dead Poet Society or the teacher in Dead Poet Society played by Mork from Ork, that's a extremely rare thing and may not even exist today anymore because that guy in that movie, he went out of his way to teach nonconformity. And he's basically run out of the school for doing it. So that – he was probably – you know what was his name? Not Mork from Ork. It doesn't matter. It was Robin Williams. Those teachers that teach nonconformity, especially with Common Core, that doesn't exist anymore today. Chancellor Harris, the phone calls for you. It's God. He says we should have girls at Weldon. Look, have I studied the latest theories from academia to explain the Great Pyramids? I really haven't spent a lot of time on that recently, I'll be honest with you. And I agree that I'm sure these theories are a bit more sophisticated than what Charlton Heston presented to us in the Ten Commandments, the movie. That his old, his, it, was, it was actually his mother, the old women, greasing before the 40-ton stone or the 50-ton stone blocks. Old women down there on all fours greasing the blocks with rags while the sick and the frail and the starving pull the blocks with ropes. I'm sure the modern theories have come a long way since the movie The Ten Commandments was made and the old women were just shown greasing the blocks, and that'll get it done. But I I don't, under any circumstance, believe a group of starving Israelites could pull 20 or 40-ton block up 250 feet in the air. 
I don't think the same group could pull a 20-ton block down off the side of the face of Mount Everest. Just down, I don't think they could do it, let alone 250 to 400 feet up into the air. How good was that grease, man? I want to, and I want to get some of it if that's what they used. Was they, were they using synthetic oil? If the theory that comes out of Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, Vassar, Wesleyan, if it's a theory that's out of the box or even too simple, then these idiots can't justify their jobs or they have a tr tough time looking at themselves in the mirror. It has to be something. See, the average person really can't quite understand. You know, the math of space is a good example. The impossible math of space has to be something the average person will never be able to do or understand, where Stephen Hawking literally uses infinities to cancel infinities in his equations. That's what dark matter is. Well, we think we know what gravity is. All the equations work, but there's this huge thing we can't account for. Uh, sir, I have, a, I have a solution. What's your solution, Melvin? We'll just make some shit up to make the equation work. You want to just make the shit up? Well, people will be exposed. Not if you call it dark matter and dark energy. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. See, see they, nobody can see it. It's there, and we need it to make our equations work. That's freaking genius, Melvin. Ask the Bard College historians. Bard College, the bastion of the liberal Lochnar. Ask these Bard College high IQ people <laughs> why a supposedly intelligent race like mankind has no history past about 4,500 years ago. Or pretty much no history past 3,000 and some years ago. But they'll act like they know. The Bard College professors, they'll act like they know. They don't know. They don't know shit. Now, don't talk to me about, Matt, here's a history of artifacts. We have these hieroglyphics. We have this faked Rosetta Stone. We have these 10,000-year-old cave drawings. We have thousands of year old. Don't tell me about that. That doesn't, that doesn't explain who I am. Those dumb cave paintings that Val Kilmer showed his son Alexander in the movie Alexander, just showing some stick figure, throwing some stick figure spear through a willy mammoth. That doesn't tell me who I am where I came from, my race, the human being, cave painting ain't shit. That's all. Okay, is that what you have at Oxford and Cambridge? Is that what you used to put the pieces together? That's not good enough. A intelligent race would have provided a lot more. This is where the gaps in, in, in history are most profound. It doesn't make sense that a civilization would construct giant pyramids. I'm not just talking about the Great Pyramid, megalithic structures all over the world, and then not sign their name to it. Not even mention in a Rosetta Stone any little bit about the culture that built the thing. It's, it doesn't make any sense. You know, but these, these academics with tenure will take five pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, which is really a thousand pieces. They'll take the five and they'll use the five pieces they have and they're all they're not even good pieces it's like the cave drawings that val kilmer showed his son and then they'll extrapolate an hd image and tell you what really happened in their published book and then they'll expect to get paid for the book which then leads to lectures and getting laid that's all that matters so for these 100 or more world megalith sites all these academics all they have is a bullshit guess as to what went on or how it was constructed, or the nature of the civilization that was there, and then they just deliver it with a fake confidence. It's probably the reason the seven wonders of the modern or the ancient world exists. If you just highlight seven wonders, and you know you can pre present a story about the seven wonders, then it distracts from what should be hundreds of wonders that can't be explained. People just think there are seven. There's probably 700. So there's no written record of over 99 point whatever percent of our history, which makes no sense. It's absolutely, if you just stop to think of it, everybody just accepts that that's normal, that there isn't. But, so Plato's allegory of the cave and little stories can be carried forth. But, the, you know, anything about human being history going back just a few extra thousand years B.C., that's just there's nothing it's bizarre that we don't know our own history and where we came from. At least we should have a record going back 20, 30,000 years, something. From now on, we should call this gigantic gap in history, which who knows? It seems like hundreds of thousands of years. This giant gap 
um, in history. We're going to call no man's land. They'll just make it seem like we went from monkey people, you know, some very much resembled uh, apes, Darwin, of course, and we went from pooping in the woods, just trying to steal morsels of food from the lemurs that lived in the neighboring trees. We went from that to the pharaohs of Egypt moving 30 ton blocks uh, 400 feet into the air. Just there's a big gap. How do we how do we go from monkey people, basically Tarzan types trying to steal food from lemurs in the neighboring tree? We went from that to building the Sphinx. How what's the there's a there's a little bit of a gap in there, you know? I'm gonna call it no man's land. It just how do you explain that? You know they can't. <laughs> it's a joke. I don't know. Maybe there were these highly advanced civilizations going back hundreds of thousands of years. There's no record of it. I mean, but Atlantis, Lemuria, maybe. I don't know. They covered it all up perfectly. I, that's pretty hard to do. But, you know, again, I, I'm not, I don't want to stray this conversation into what I talked about a few videos back, that an illusory reality can accomplish a lot. I'm not going to go there in, in this video. This is going to be more along the lines of if you pick a brick up and drop it on your foot, that brick is real and it will hurt. I'm not going to go there. I mean, on who's listening, we'll do that some other time. But because there's this records doesn't exist of these highly advanced ancient civilizations, then one has to keep on the table at least that this reality or wherever this place is where we live is far newer than anybody has ever considered. Because if it's as old as they say, then you know the history has been been hidden. Of course, there's no other explanation. Maybe it's far newer than people think. But usually, just to back up a bit and to, to wrap this section up, when something like Atlantis, the legend, the story of Atlantis, has been discussed hundreds of thousands of times, we've heard it on TV shows and stories and legends, and you heard it in school, countless books and movies. You know, it's where Aquaman came from, right? When you hear it this much, there's a reason for it. Not as much so going by their track record that it means it's absolutely real. It could be a truth drop, but it also can be used by an evil genius system as a, as an incredible deception, getting people to think that there is this hundred thousand, two, three, four hundred thousand year history when in fact uh, there might not be even nearly that sort of tale on our own history, straying into very, very uh, deep thinking type places here. And it's not the purpose of just this funny video exposing the fake history. But if the human race and our civilization is, in fact, far younger than what they would want you to Darwin believe and that sort of thing, then they've hidden that from us. Either way, they've lied. It doesn't see – either way, it's still – a lie, an incredible deception and manipulation pulled off in inhuman fashion. Regular people couldn't pull this off. They've hidden. Matt, I believe we have a, a very long civilization going back to Atlantis, Lemuria, hundreds of thousands of years. Well, incredibly, then they've lied and covered all that up. Okay. Or if we have the, the, we haven't been here this long at all, they make it look like we've been here hundreds of thousands of years atlantis lemuria darwin if it was if it's a new civilization a new construct for a human being then they've lied about that it's a lie either way the purpose of this video is just to point out that's a lie and to make fun of it along the way no matter what you believe anybody listening to this whether yeah matt we you know there's been a recent cataclysm we haven't been here very long or, you know, we, Atlantis is real, Matt Lemire. We have this huge tale of, of what a human being was and past ancient civilizations. See, either way, we agree they've somehow lied and cover it up. And that brings us right, right back to this, my step two. You know, what kind of reality could pull that off? The complete cover up with what people are saying in academia and how science and scientists love Darwin, how they could pull this off to such a degree to hide human beings from who they really are, what they really are. They hide our history. They also hide or, or remove us from who we really are right now. It, it's not, there's nothing that could potentially or possibly be pulled off by just 
you know, human beings sitting around a table talking about how are we going to screw these people? It's not, it's, it's beyond what these minions are, are capable of. We, I think we all agree on that. This presentation is about how general history across the board is a lie. No matter where we disagree on the specifics, I'm not going to show you, I can't show you fancy charts, graphs, statistics. I'm going to use the lost art of common sense. Kevin Bacon, because I can add, I'm going to show you common sense, not statistics. There's the lie. There's the big lie, the biggest lie, and then there's statistics. People can use statistics to prove almost anything. Take your pick. I can use statistics to show you that that little announcer on NBC, Bob Costas, that little guy, that little peckerwood boy does the Olympics. Is he still around, that little Bob Costas? I can use statistics to show you he has more baby mamas around the country than Adrian Peterson does. There are hundreds of these, quote, megalithic sites all over the world. Hundreds where it can be demonstrated pretty easily that no culture that supposedly just had ropes and donkeys and hammers and jackasses and chisels could have built the thing. No, but, but the point here is not to get into that again. The point is, why is this never discussed in any school book or history book or anything in school or academia debating how this could have been done or if it should not have been able to be done? It's never raised. It's just an academic. They have an explanation for it. And I'm sure if you looked hard enough – and you'd find the explanation. It's just this this explanation for it must exist somewhere. It's never questioned. There's always this underlying assumption, as you learn about it in high school, that, oh, those fuckers just knew what they were doing way back when. And they had more skill than the elves did in The Lord of the Rings, Elveron. You know, we just assume, as we learn about these megalith sites and the ancient wonders of the world and the Parthon and everything else in between, we just assume that these... These poor bastards way back in the day had like 10 times the worth at work ethic of the seven dwarves. And we just assume they weren't lazy motherfuckers like today's man is. You know, they're just whistling while they work. You know, these, these craftsmen that built the cathedral at Cologne just whistle while they work as they move millions of pounds 300 feet up into the air with ropes. Are you kidding me? The, the the main part here, guy, guys, is, is how it's just it, it just you could go through all of school, including a master's degree, and it just glossed over, glossed over. You could be a history major, and they'll gloss it over. These people back in the day were, were not likely as guardian supermen. They were probably like regular people or less. It might be like David Spade as he was portrayed in Joe Dirt. They didn't have multivitamins probably grew to about five foot five they didn't have vaccines they just died died off i mean they weren't we you'd you'd have to be for them to construct this shit everybody back in the day would have had to have been like bolvi that character in the 13th warrior they all would have been had to be bolvi or there's no way any of this shit could have been built but the funniest part about all of this is the irony or the irony that history presents or history presents in movies so let's just look at braveheart for example what was that supposed to be? 1500 and something, like around 1600, around there, all right? So they show Braveheart, Mel Gibson. He comes back to his little Scottish uh, hamlet, and he's fixing his thatched roof. His, his, they live, all it is is stones piled up. <laughs> he's, here's how they live. Stones piled up next to a creek and just, you know, sewing together your thatched roof uh, once a week as the storm blows the damn roof off. Huffs and puffs, a big bad wolf comes and blows the roof off. So that exists, but there are these mega, massive, 100 million pound cathedrals built at that time all over the world. St. Peter's Basilica built all these megalith stru structures, the Great Pyramids, the temples in Cambodia. Then they show Mel Gibson, you know, up on his roof, putting his thatched roof together and they come by and he's if you can prove you'll stay out of the troubles you may call me daughter <laughs> didn't i just prove it i want to stay out of the troubles didn't i just prove it no wallace shit look how the merry men of robin hood were living the most famous group of people in the world look how they were living at least how it's presented in the kevin costner movie with his moorish friend morgan freeman they were living under a tree there wasn't even a tent but there, these cathedrals and massive structures existed all over the world. The irony of it is hilarious. The merry men were living a lot worse than Braveheart. 
But all these massive castles had existed all over the world for like 300 to 400 years prior, some thousands of years prior. You would think, I don't know, by that time, the Scottish clans would have at least built something better, akin to like maybe a Toll Brothers home. What are they just, just I'm going to make my home here from Medan. I'm just going to pile rocks up, slap some mud on it and put a thatched roof. That's all they could do. Why don't they get some building techniques from the people that built these cathedrals? Longshank, Longshanks didn't want that. He wouldn't. He had the building technique. He didn't want to send it north. He needed. He needed those Scottish beaten down so they were easier to control. You know, if Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan, the Khan ruled the world, right? Where's his giant castle or golden cathedral? He was still sleeping in a tent on the Mongolian highlands the whole time. He didn't build himself any grand palace. The Chinese culture is more ancient than most. Where are their giant castles and Cologne-type cathedrals? The construction of the Forbidden City actually seems doable for the time. Finally, construction that actually fits in with what would be expected in the time period. Oh, Mike, finally, a bit of history, at least from architecture, that makes sense. You know, something that makes sense. You know, I wouldn't ruin the entire look of the Forbidden City, though, with a 400-foot painting of Mao, but if that's what they decide to do, then that's it's their choice. Back in the day, as we all read our 10th grade history books, it was just assumed that these poor, starving bastards applied the necessary elbow grease to get it all done, and to hoist the 10,000-pound columns up into the air, and to hold up the 1,000,000-pound ceilings, and just all the rest. It doesn't matter that it's simply impossible for donkeys and jackasses and ropes and even elephants. The Indians said elephants. They, you can't do it even with elephants. All this construction, even if you're using a variety of your fantastic beasts, it's like asking a fly to haul a cinder block clear across Florida. And I'm talking north to south. I'm not talking about the easy job it would be for the fly to drag the cinder block from east to west across Alligator Alley to Miami. That might be relatively... I'm talking north to south. That's how hard it would be for the ancient cultures and their fantastic beasts to, to build this stuff. One key thing to point out is we struggled to fill in the pieces. And we point at the professors and say they don't know. But most people listening to this, we do see there is a minion class here some sort of sick puppeteer and we're pretty sure they know they however this shit got here they probably know you know there's things that have always been kept from quote their term not mine human beings you know we'll talk about it again what do we really think is in the vatican library entire library just so one man can check out one book at a time what do you think's in the vatican library well matt the stuff they stole from the library at Alexandria. Yeah, probably. But what's in it? Is it just Archie and Jughead comics? Josie and the Pussycat collections for a Pope in the past that liked that sort of thing? Just pick out his favorite comic book once a week and check it out? For crying out loud, the Da Vinci Code 2, Angels and Demons. You know, they almost shot uh, Robert Langdon. They almost shot Tom Hanks for tearing out one page from one book. In the Vatican Library. They were pissed. He's trying to save them from the whole Vatican exploding from an antimatter annihilation explosion that very afternoon. It was going to blow up in like two hours, and they're pissed about one page. It's just kind of, is it a truth drop? Probably not. But if there was a truth drop there, it would tell you the importance of what is in places you and I can't go, like the Vatican Library. My gosh, Robert Langdon. What if he removed the entire comic book? What would they have done to him? Shoot him. But he's about to save the Vatican from antimatter annihilation. I don't care. Shoot him. He took a comic book out. The Pope didn't give him permission. When we have these conversations, we're mostly talking about the ancient shit everybody's heard about, like the Roman Colosseum or the Great Wall of China. We'll get to that Great Wall. I mean, you get the, the story of the Great Wall. What a joke that is. But this is just the shit we've heard about. There's tons of other stuff, mostly amazingly covered uh, over the years, she's actually has gone out to these sites, like the New Earth Channel's gone out to these sites, exposed these things called, is it called Via Cavas? You know, the New Earth Channel, these things called Via Cavas, which just like this path carved through stone. Like what? Well, what's the purpose of a, of, a, of a path carved through solid stone? Who could possibly do this? 
you know, somebody way back when, thousands of years ago, said, Daddy, 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 we need to save five minutes off our journey to Grandma's house. We need a more direct route. Let's carve a channel through a few million tons of stone. Oh, that's a great idea, son. I'll get to it. So pausing you, where did all this shit come from all over the world? I assure you, a gigantic 20-ton head didn't come free with a Domino's pizza order when they ordered a large mushroom on Easter Island. Here's your pizza, and here's your 20-ton head. They could do what they used to do at McDonald's. Collect all five. Order next week, you get a different head, and you can make yourself a temple. Everything was grander back in the day. Today we have Happy Meals. You get a toy, different toy every week. Back then, maybe you ordered and you got a gigantic head that were they used to create Easter Island. Collect all five. You don't, you don't know. Those heads might have been the Happy Meals back in the day. You don't know. Okay, let's get a little bit more serious and look at the Great Wall, the Great Wall of China. Different sections built at different times. Last section apparently built close to 1600. Sections built 1300, 1100, 1300. 1,000 total miles. <laughs> 13,000 total miles. I mean, let's say it was just 1,000. Would it be believable? If you fly from New York to Los Angeles, I believe it's just under 3,000 miles. Let's round it up to 3,000 miles. It's New York to L.A., L.A. to New York, New York to L.A., L.A. to New York. You do that bump, 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 and you still are short. <laughs> You're still short as to how long the Great Wall is, transversing the United States four times. Right. What does it say in Wikipedia? Oh, it was built to um, oh to keep at bay or to hold back uh, potentially nomadic invaders from Eurasia. I mean, who would be so dumb as to believe anything about the official story associated with the Great Wall? This is like... For me, because I don't like my neighbor's barking dog, it's like me erecting the Hoover Dam between our homes to keep out the neighbor's barking dog. This is how ridiculous this story is. People screaming at me, well, what is it? I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to get into it in this type of presentation. There's a lot of very big thinkers who have sent me emails, have exchanged ideas with a lot of people, and it's not appropriate for this video as to what all this stuff is. It's not what's the Great Wall, what's the Great Pyramid, what are the Via Cavas, what's Easter Island, what what all of it is. It, it takes big thinking um, to, to to go there. That's not the purpose of this video. Is just is just in a funny way saying this ridiculous narrative and the stories they put out in what you call history book is a joke, and why can't people see through it? You know. How, do you have any idea how impossible it is to erect a 13,000-mile wall between 1,000 A.D. and 1,600 A.D.? Just finding the stones is impossible. Nomadic invaders from the north? I'd be, if they said in Wikipedia it's to keep out space invaders, the video game, I'd be more apt to believe it. Okay, sir. My generation... The generation before me, my grandfather's generation, my great grandfather's generation, all these generations, we finally built the thing, Ming. <laughs> we finally built the thing, Ming. And it's, it's you've got all 13,000 miles built. We've got all 13,000 miles built. We can finally feel secure and protected. Uh, sir, Mr. Ming? Um, yeah, I was thinking, um, these barbarians and nomadic invaders from Eurasia, they can get over the wall with simply vines and bamboo constructed ladders that they could make an hour before they try to scale the walls. See how the problem? Oh, we're going to have to put centuries up there. We're going to have to man it with thousands of people in case these nomadic hordes get the idea that you can vine together a bamboo ladder and get over the damn thing. For crying out loud, the undead... The undead zombies were able to climb the walls and get into Winterfell in Game of Thrones. And they were slow. The undead, they, were, they were pretty for the undead zombies. The one in Games of Thrones are pretty fast. They were able to get over that wall. And the defenders and Jon Snow and these guys had a dragon to push them back. And it still was useless, their wall. So what's this great wall going to do? I guess in Winterfell, the wall was like only just a few hundred yards long. They had an entire army there, and it was defensible. I guess that makes sense. Plus, the dragon helps. But 13,000 miles of wall? How's that defensible? How did the Chinese, afraid of these invaders, monitor the wall? 13,000 miles. Did they have a sentry 
every hundred feet. Do the math on that. How many it would take? Maybe they used drones and closed circuit TV viewed from the Forbidden City, and they didn't need the sentries. I don't know. They not only made the wall, but we're meant to believe that they defended every foot of it. With there's mad, there are sentry posts and turrets and things like. Really? Okay. Well, so what? I never said I know what it is. I don't know what it is. I just don't believe what Wikipedia says it is. So I'm supposed to believe that they made the mall, the wall, and then the defenders of the wall. They were so naive to think, or they just didn't realize that guys with vines and bamboo ladders could get over it at any point. You know, or were the sentries defending it close enough where they could like maybe you had to keep that many sentries because barbarians with vines and bamboo ladders could get over it, you needed sentries close enough where they could actually yell back and forth and talk to one another. You think there's a sentry every 100 miles, maybe there's a sentry every 50 feet. They need tens of thousands of sentries so so close together they could yell back and forth and play a game of chess against each other, just yell the moves out into the air. Be quiet, I think I heard something at the bottom of the wall. But I've got to move, rook to e7, shut up. There could be a barbarian hordes down here. Shut up. Okay, we've established we need the centuries and a whole lot of them, maybe tens of thousands. How do you feed them? How do you feed them? Is they, on the other side of the Great Wall, they have just a stretch every 20 miles. There's a McDonald's or El Polo Loco. How do you get the Chinese food delivered to such an expanse? You know, what Chinese food delivery? Or, or they have Uber Eats or something? How would they get the food all these centuries? You know, it's not like uh, they have to... Rodney Dangerfield, remember in Caddyshack, he just with Wang, he just bought land on on one side of the Great Wall on the good side. Maybe maybe he helped with some sort of Cisco food logistics business to defeat all these centuries. I don't know. It's it's not easy to get Chinese food even under the best of circumstances. Elaine from Seinfeld had to lie and go across the street. She was outside the delivery zone. She had to go across the, across the street, stand in a broom closet. To get her delivery. Think how hard it was to get the Chinese food delivered along the 13,000 miles of the Great Wall. So what are you saying then, crazy sir? That the Great Wall was not built for what they say it was built for on Wikipedia? Really? You must be new here. Yeah, of course, that's what I'm saying. About the wall and about everything else. You new here? I'd sooner believe the Great Wall was the main gate of the world's biggest fortune cookie factory than whatever they say it is on Wikipedia. One of the main points in this general discussion about all these different things is not that it couldn't be done, but that also the reason it was done, however it was done by whatever, it's not whatever they say it was you even used for a lot of these things. Like the Great Pyramid. It ain't no burial tomb. Give me a break. There's a lot of brilliant theories. People say whatever it is, whoever however it was built, how it couldn't could be built, couldn't be built, but the reason for it burial chamber come on dude it, it, energy harvesting or resonance or ley lines or it's just things that they'll never tell you about on a college campus that these gerald lambeau type a-hole professors would never ever even if they want to think that way it's not approved by the provost the great parent ain't no burial tomb you know just think of these kings and emperors and pharaohs we we know they we, it's not really going out on a limb to say they had big egos probably well yeah matt that's of course they're big egos that's why they build the big big burial tomb you're proving my point well here here's a problem can you imagine the gargantuan asshole ego it would take to demand a burial tomb half the size of new york city yeah you think i'm proving your point but see the master builder Upon he There's a couple problems. The master builder, upon hearing the news of what he was being expected or asked to do, would know how impossible it was, and he would immediately flee the country with his young wife. He'd go off to Timbuktu and hide out. He'd say, I can't, I can't get this done. I'm going to fail, man. I better take the young wife and flee to Timbuktu. All the master builders would, would walk off the job. They'd flee for their lives. Nobody would even attempt it. But here's the big problem. It would take more than a lifetime to construct any of this stuff, to build any of this shit. How'd you build that shit? It, it would take more than a lifetime, assuming it could even be done at all. So let's assume the emperor, with this gargantuan a-hole ego, he demands that his slaves, and he demands that his Vincent Price master builder from the Ten Commandments, he demands these things get built for his burial tomb. But it's not going to be available in his lifetime. It doesn't make any sense. 
He's just so altruistic. He's going to build it. I'm building this for my son. What? That doesn't fit with the story then. How would that work out for Mr. Ego? Because it would not be ready in his lifetime. On the day of his death, it would just be partially finished. It would, just be a partially, it would look like ruins. It would be a partially finished piece of shit. Then did he propose then they put his body on ice for a few hundred years until it was done? Maybe that's what Vanilla Sky is really about. <laughs> or, or is that what mummification is really about? You've got to preserve the body until the, bur- the gigantic Great Pyramid burial chamber is, of, is ready for these egotistical pharaoh assholes. That's what mummifi- mummification is not for the afterward. It, it's to make sure the body's still there by the time you finish the damn tomb. How did Vincent Price and the Ten Commandments even obtain the title of Master Builder if nothing can be finished in the lifetime of the guy who's building it or who it's being built for? Typically, the title of Master is reserved for people who can actually finish something. It's not just the pyramids. For some strange reason, all the builders of the megastructures of antiquity work this way. They're just selfless people who started jobs that could never be seen to completion in their natural lifetime. You know, it's not just... The Sphinx, or the, or it's also the cathedrals of Cologne in Germany, or the ten of the ones like Cologne in Italy. Yes, Clarice, that's the Duomo scene overlooking the Belvedere. You know Florence? Every one of these poor bastards began the project with some selfless integrity, knowing it will not be completed in their Vincent Price lifetimes. And forget the master builder. How about the good pope or the good king? I'd like to start this. It won't benefit me, but it'll benefit future generations. They didn't, they didn't care about future generations. It didn't work that way. I'd be more apt they build it in a day because that's what they want to see it done. They're not going to do it for the next generation. I put it to you, Greg. Is that consistent with what you would expect about the, through the egos or from the egos of these sorts of kings and emperors and pharaohs and assholes? No. See, all of this has proven the application of common sense is a real problem for these tenured Gerald Lambo assholes. Okay, that's the end of the ancient megalith site, like Joe Pesci said in My Cousin Vinny. I'm done with this guy. Let's move on to something else. Let's look at Greece. Greece, considered to be the first well-documented written history, came from Greece, the age of enlightenment and the age of the brilliant thinkers. Let's take a look at Greece. Did you see the movie 300 with the ripped abs, the naked Spartans, fending off Xerxes' million warriors with his little A-team of guys with their ripped abs, bringing them through the hot gates? Now, many will say the movie 300, the Spartans versus the Persians, the Iranians, at the hot gates. They would say that's just an absurd exaggeration. These are stories, Matt. Absurd exaggeration of history. Just a movie. Hot gates. Well, they, damn right it's hot. You saw those abs on Gerard Butler, didn't you? That's hot, man. But it is absurd. But what's on the screen, what they're presenting in that movie, is accepted history. It's Herodotus. Herodotus is accepted history. This guy, Herodotus, outlined what really happened in ancient Greece and in this example at the Hot Gates. He outlined all this stuff about the war in his comic book. Read Herodotus. It's ridiculous. He knows every little detail of what happened. I'll read you a passage right now. Okay, here are the books. When I was in high school, we had to buy these things called the Great Books Reading and Discussion Program. And every year, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, in English class, we had three or four of these books Different passages from different, quote, great works, uh, partial passages, uh, part of Hamlet, for example, then Herodotus, then a chapter from the Iliad, all over the place to give us an exposure to these great works. And of course, you know, it's presented as completely real. In the preface, it says Herodotus is known, uh, born for about 400 BC, as the father of history. It doesn't say it's fiction or science fiction or Nancy Drew, but you just read this. It's, it's like, well, how could he have known all of this? Half of it, not maybe half of it, but there's tons of direct quotes of what exactly Xerxes said. Even if Herodotus was hand of the king and was right there next to Xerxes during this whole thing, he wouldn't have the exact quotes. Just read your stuff at random. It reads like a, a fiction novel. It is a fiction novel. Xerxes' fleet now left Therma, and ten of the fastest ships set a course direct for Siathos, where three Greek vessels, one from Trozen, one from Aegina, and one from Attica, were the lookout. Just that by itself, one sentence. 
how would he know 10 of the fastest? How would he know it was 10 vessels? How would he know they're the fastest? How would he know one Greek vessel, nuclear vessel, was from Trozen, one from Aegina? How would he know the other one was from Attica? The level of detail he presents in each section is absurd. Somebody that's the hand of the king was there the whole, wouldn't know all of this. And the quotes are ridiculous. Quote, Artabanus, Xerxes replied, quote, a lot of men here upon earth is indeed as you have described it, but let us put aside these gloomy reflections, for we have pleasant things in hand. Now tell me, if that figure had not appeared to you so vividly in your dream, would you have clung to your original option? Blah, blah. It just goes quote after quote after quote. It's like a guy running behind Xerxes with a tape recorder wouldn't be able to record so much. We just turn to any passage at random. There's just too much detail. Uh, these decisions were put into force at once. Three men set off to Asia to collect information. They arrived in Sardis and found out all they could about the king's army, but were caught in the process, tortured by the Persian army commanders, and condemned to death. But when Xerxes was told that they were about to be executed, he disapproved of his general's decisions and sent men from his bodyguards with orders, if the three spies were still alive, to bring them before him. As the sentence had not yet been carried out, the spies were brought to the king, who, having satisfied himself about the reason for their presence in Star... How does he know Xerxes was satisfied? How does he know it was three men? One little thing about three little spies, uh, Herodotus, just one little thing went down in the course of this whole war about these three little spies. He knew what Xerxes was thinking. He regretted this. He said this. I mean, come on. It's a joke. I don't buy it for a second. And I'm sure a few people are starting to yell at this presentation saying, Matt, okay, it's one thing to try to prove most of the history presentation is fake, but stop trying to prove to us that the movie 300 was fake. Obviously, the movie was 300 was fake. What I'm saying is we, I have these great books, okay, that was, it was AP English, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. The preface right here says Herodotus is the father of history. It doesn't say here it, it, with Herodotus listed right next to the Iliad and right next to Macbeth and all these other great works. It doesn't say that, well, it is well known that Herodotus used uh, literary privilege and made a lot of it up. It says he's the father of history. This is being presented as history. It's not just, of course, the movie, the God King Xerxes in the movie 300. That's not following Herodotus to the T. Forget the movie. Of course, that's ridiculous. But the movie generally follows Herodotus, which is accepted history. It, you know, that's what I'm saying. It is that absurd. If you forget the detail of Herodotus, just in general, why would Xerxes send a massive army to fight in a phone booth? So the odds even out to fight in a phone booth against the 300. So it's completely even odds. His, his strength and numbers do nothing. Why do you even have to land there? Greece, basically an island. You could go, you'd land anywhere. Yeah, he had to land in the exact spot where he has to go through these, these hot gates. I mean, come on. You know, what's something wrong with Xerxes if he made that decision? Just, he wasn't, what's that movie? He wasn't right in the head. What's that movie? Oh, that's from Braveheart. He says, I didn't like him anyway. Xerxes, he wasn't right in the head. If you stack a massive army into a tiny alleyway, you know, the gangs from the video Beat It could probably hold back Xerxes if it was just in a small alley. Those geeks from Beat It. Field Marshal Gerling's battalion, battalion couldn't, couldn't get through the hot gates if it was that tight. Something wrong was there. Something wrong in the head. If, he, if that was his decision to land there, he could land it anywhere. You know, I'm sure there are other places to land on Greece. Okay, cliffs or no cliffs. The white gates of Cliffs of Dover or no white Cliffs of Dover, which I know are, running, are in England. But there are only two things are possible here. Either it just didn't happen, none of it, basically, or Xerxes is the dumbest motherfucking king of all time. Not Gog King from the movie, dumbass Forrest Gump King. Let's continue to follow Greece, but change up a little bit and go look at something over here. Leave the wars and the ripped abs behind. About the same time, kind of, we have these great thinkers emerging from Greece, the great writers and thinkers, and oh, wow, Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and Hippocrates, which I like him. My favorite of all time, of course, is do no harm. This is the biggest truth drop in history, do no harm. I'm talking about 
medical or anything like that. It's not. It should be practiced by today's politicians or anybody else in authority that just wants to get in your business all the time and put their sticky little fingers all over everything. Do no harm. They're trying to put their sticky fingers on everything. Hundreds of millions of lines of laws, ordinance, code, and regulation. You know that do no harm law or tenet. It's presented by history, presented by history itself, presented by the system itself for good reason. And most things, the truth drop. Most things work out if left alone. Few things don't, like ringworm doesn't get better. Few things don't, but most things work out if they're just left alone. Today we have all the, this massive job of the hut infrastructure puts his sticky, greasy tentacles all over everything. It's just like Obamacare at 20,000 pages of regulation, and it just gets more effed up. Today we observe hundreds of thousands of politicians at all levels meddling in everything they can put their greasy little hands on. Millions and bill, Carl Sagan, billions of lines of new laws and statute. Essentially, not do no harm, doing harm to everything that they touch and destroying everything by design. Yeah, healthcare wasn't screwed up enough. So you add the 20,000 pages of HHS regulations along with almost the 3,000 pages of Obamacare. You add that and, 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 that, and you tell the people this is going to affix it. And whole new bureaucratic job of the hut sail barge uh, administrators to take care of everything. There's even now a diagnostic code for being bitten by a duck. There's diagnostic codes for being bitten by different types of animals in Obamacare. I'm not kidding. I'm not joking about that. And if you don't get the damn diagnostic code correct for the demented duck, then your claim's never paid. It just goes into an endless loop. It's years and decades before you ever get reimbursed. So using the Kevin Bacon degrees will leap from do no harm, like you know, regarding medical and everything else the politicians do the opposite of. They just do harm. We'll leap that over to, from do no harm to George Washington's no foreign entanglements. George Washington, of course, in that comic book, laid down and says, no foreign entanglements. They have, see, they have to tell you what really should be done, and then, then they can get away with it. It says, well, the founding fathers clearly said what should or shouldn't be done. Then we do the opposite, and nobody cares. People just worried about the next Netflix series coming out. He said, no foreign entanglements. Gentle George. What do we have? We have every possible degree of foreign entanglement you know, I believe in a one-world system, but we'll just keep, we'll just assume for the present base of this presentation, the United States is completely autonomous and does its own thing. It's a real country, so we have eighty countries that have U.S. military bases. George Washington saying no foreign entanglements, and there are military bases in over eighty countries. In every foreign entanglement that a government could possibly get into over a 200-year period this government has gotten involved in. See the irony of the, of the founding father, the king, saying no foreign entanglements. That's how they have to do business. I don't, you know, we'll ponder it some other time why they have to do that. There's literally nothing that big governments and the politicians have not put their hands on and successfully put their hands on to screw it up. It doesn't matter how far away from home it is. It's a conversation way back when about the Philippines, the Philippine Islands. These islands here, sir, I mean, this is like 100 years ago. You know, well, where are these islands? Oh, sir, we don't need to bother with them. You know, there's a generally, this is 100 and some years ago, generally poor people. Japan's been screwing them over for, yeah, we just just stay away. You know, it's, it's 10,000 miles away on the other side of this thing we call Earth, you know, these Philippine islands, what should we do? Well, we should put our sticky fingers into it. We should go there and try to screw it up and try to, try to tell them what they should do, get in their business. They have to do this, the creeps. They just have to. It is the role that they play. Okay, kind of strayed from the do no harm thing over to the no foreign entanglements thing. Let's get back to still in Greece. We have these great writings by these, these gigantic thinkers and the great philosophers, Plato and Socrates, you know, all the names. So here's what my problem is with all this. Whether it be capturing Socrates' last words by Plato or 
you know, laying down the concept, the concept for the movie, The Matrix, laying it down in approximately like 300 BC with Plato's allegory of the cave and all these great works and philosophical thinking. The problem is, um, how did the written word of all these great works, how did they survive the next, say, 2,000 years? I, I'm just, just, just go right to the most basic level. How is it possible Plato's allegory of the cave is in Wikipedia today? How did it get from here to there or from there to here? How did it happen? Logistically, the paper itself, it doesn't matter how good or bad the writing is. It could be the most wonderful writing in the world, word from Aristotle that everybody that reads it says, oh, this needs to be saved. Or it could be something that back in the day would not have been considered that good. Back in the day, nobody would have thought Plato's allegory of the cave was so great. Guys in the cave and just, oh, they're just being fooled showing shadow figures. It's only great to us today based on bigger ways of thinking about, you know, tying in movies like The Matrix, quantum issues, how reality breaks down at the very, very small and the very, very large. Things, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no consciousness there to observe it, does it make a sound? All the things today that gets us very excited about Plato's allegory of the cave. I've gone through this many times. You know where I'm going to go. Back in the day, no one would have given a shit. It would have been some stupid story. It wouldn't have survived. Nobody would have thought they'd live in any sort of illusion or said, well, that's real big thinking by Plato. If he, Whatever he wrote it down, even the greatest of works, I don't think, could have survived. I think it's carried through history on purpose, by design, by the minions. We'll talk about that some other time. How did the actual writing, the paper itself, survive? Um... Did Plato take – I keep saying this. I know it's Plato, but I'm kind of used to saying, just like I say, Hippocrates. Did he take inspiration from Moses and he carved his ideas into stone tablets so they would be preserved? How was this paper preserved? I mean, look, but if you look at old gravestones, even from 200 years back, many of them you can't even read because of the weathering and the rain. It all runs off, even if you put it in stone, which he didn't. That may not have lasted, but somehow papers did. Who had the papers for the last 2,000 years? We have to assume he used paper. It was probably some cheap-ass flimsy papyrus. One spark. They've all been gone. Who held the papers for thousands of years of safekeeping? Maybe I could see today keeping it in the, uh, the, the Smithsonian and behind Argonne glass or something. But who in 100 AD, 400 AD, 700 AD, the midst of this plague, the midst of this war, where, where was all – who was carrying – forth all this Plato and Socrates and Aristotle stuff through history. How? Who were the people that carried these papers through time? Who held it from the birth of Christ all the way through 1500 AD, 1600 AD? In whose basement was it sitting for hundreds of years? Since, well, Matt, it must have been the Library of Alexander, then the Vatican Library. Well, really? Then show me the lineage of it. Who carried it through time? We don't have any of the, this information. Since we're told almost every city burned, almost every major structure at some point succumbed to fire, even more, how did Plato's papers survive? Plato or Plato? How was the writing of Plato reintroduced then? If it, even if it could survive, how was it reintroduced into the modern understanding of history? Like with most things, when you get into this level of detail, a lot of it starts to break down. Basically, looking at any presentation of authority in close enough detail, it all breaks down. I mean, what happened? I know this is absurd, but just to get you thinking, you know, did somebody on behalf of the Vatican call some guy at the New York Times? I'd like to talk to the uh, editor-in-chief, please. Uh, there's a package on the way to you, sir. And there's these writings from Aristotle, all the great writings from Greece. We preserved it. And we want you to reintroduce it into your school systems, into your university libraries. And there's also an, an additional package in the back. We want you to look into corruption at Shawshank. You send that along to the right authorities. They'll arrest um, the captain of the guard, Hadley. But, but, but for the most part, we want you to introduce these great works back into your university and your high school's school system. And um, you'll receive that package in a few days. So please look out for it. Okay, that's ridiculous, but seriously, it, it'll break down. Try it. Chase it back, and it doesn't have to be Aristotle's works. Shakespeare, Dante, Chaucer, whoever. How did it get? How did it all get in everybody's library? How did it all get in every university library, in every high school library? Okay, 
well, it came from this book, this book called The Great Works. And well, where did that come from? If you trace it back, you'll see it. eventually there's a problem where, okay, people that follow the Bible, we trace that back through 1600 and something. King James uh, had the original transcripts, translation. Okay, that that is at least more easily followed. But all of these great works from roughly 2,000 years ago, it's like, well, well, how'd they get? The first book uh, that carried forth the works of Shakespeare or the works of Aristotle, um, here's a book from 18-whatever. Well, where'd that come from? Well, how did it get in that book? Who's the person that stood up and said, I have the original documents, or at least, not, I know not the original. Of course, I understand um, they can get Samuel Tarley and the Maesters to rescribe or, or retranslate or at least make copies, handwritten copies, so they're in a few different places. But trace it back. You'll see the problems you run into. Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. They said Homer originally was just carrying forth an oral tradition. They didn't even write it down. Well, somebody must have listened and wrote it down. But that goes back way back B.C. You know, whatever Homer is, that like seven or 800 B.C. Well, how did the Iliad and the Odyssey find their way into the uh, Stanford University campus library? How did that happen? You could do this with anything. Shakespeare, you know, wrote how many ever plays? Was it 1600 and something for Shakespeare? And um, I assure you, if it's all part of this massive script and certain type of minion sees to the script, then, of course, it's all by design how these Shakespeare plays written by the Bacon and Sausage Society made its way into the modern university library. If it's just Shakespeare wrote these plays, you're just some guy well, how is it all perfectly preserved and collected if it wasn't part of the script put forth by the Bacon and Sausage Society? The people, the, the peasants back in the day, we, we read Shakespeare, we can barely understand it. And don't just say, oh, you know, they, they understood it back. It, even, it's such a high level of writing, I'm sure, even for that time. It wouldn't have appealed to the regular guy, way too high level. They're not, I can't even understand it. And I'm supposed to be educated. And I, obviously I know there's differences in language, even in Ben Franklin's time, the S looked like an F, but it, it was too high level. To me, it, it screams, it totally screams bacon and sausage society script. Car all this stuff carried through time as part of a script, as part of a plan. Because if you, um, there's just no way all of this would have survived. If for one example, um, Socrates or Plato's, the Crito, whatever, uh, that dialogue survived, well, then the Iliad wouldn't have. So you see what I'm saying? Well, Matt, you're, you're assuming that all these great works were preserved at 100%. There's probably a thousand things that were lost. Well, maybe. I'm just saying there's too many of them. It, it just screams script to me. But can I prove it? No, all I have is a little old thing called common sense. And who would be dumb enough to use co a common sense argument as their lead argument? That ain't, that ain't right. Now, thinking along these lines and getting your self-questioning uh, certain things in a certain way, you can jump to a lot of different topics throughout history, how it's presented. Vincent Van Gogh comes to mind. Vincent Van Gogh, what about yourself? I mean, it's a joke, the story of Vincent Van Gogh. He's just, Van Gogh, just some poor bastard. He couldn't sell his he, paintings. He was just a madman while he was alive. He was a failure. 2,100 paintings and watercolors, of which Wikipedia says, most of which were done in his last two years of life, I believe it said. It's like banging out more than one painting a day. I mean, do you, do you understand how ridiculous this is? Did the cleanup alone, just getting the supplies, you'd have, a, you'd need five helpers. Just, you have new canvas ready to go. You have new brushes ready to go. Do you know how long it takes just to clean brushes? I'll paint, use like an oil-based paint. It takes me like 30 minutes to clean up, just painting a fence. You got to put in turpentine. He's got all these different colors, canvases. Come on, man. He's a fail. He didn't, where, where'd the money come from to get all the canvases? If he was such a failure, it's a joke. It's an absolute joke. Okay, here's the, but besides that, here's, here's the big problem. If these people, like Van Gogh, were not loved and coveted or seen as genius at the time when they were doing what they were doing, 
then who saved this the poor bastard stuff and who carried it through time and why would it be saved if it wasn't considered good when he did it you know i just threw out old curtains at pam's last week at her request just throw we throw these out yeah they're old dated throw these uh these old curtains out now if these old curtains were i don't know just 100 years away from becoming more valuable than the hope diamond how the heck could I have known about it, that those curtains were going to be caught? We just got to make room. We threw them out. You know, if those curtains were, 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 were exact replicas of what Elizabeth I did and whatever, those curtains are worth 100 grand, I wouldn't have known. I still would have thrown them out. Those Van Gogh paintings, if they weren't coveted when he did them, they would have been thrown out. <laughs> Do you understand how this works? You understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? It ain't that hard. It would have thrown if you were back in the time and you van Gogh, oh that madman thank good he's dead he cut his ear off he's a loser what are we going to do with all these paintings you know you couldn't even back in the day or whatever you couldn't even unloaded Van Gogh stuff to that guy that was affiliated with Zed in Pulp Fiction he had that little shop a consignment shop where Zed went in he he wouldn't have taken his shit I mean how'd it go down how, what what really would have happened in the real world for a Van Gogh again nobody liked his shit. 2,000 paintings, you'd be like, Van Gogh just died, you know, like, relatives. Ma! Ma! Have you been down to the basement of Vincent's house? He just died. Really? Look at this shit. What, what is it? What is it, Susie? Uncle Van Gogh's shit is all over down here. His paintings. He couldn't sell one in life. Ma! These fucking paintings are everywhere. Thousands. You know, we got to burn these things to make room. We got to sell this house. Not while your grandma Jones is still alive. After your uncle cut off his ear, the only way grandma could communicate with Uncle Van Gogh was through his paintings. So they're very important to grandma Jones. But don't worry, dear. Her plague is advanced. Grandma Jones will be dead soon. And then you can burn them. In fact, the oil nut canvas is a pretty good incendiary. So we'll bring those shits up to the upstairs fireplace and use it instead of kindling. Save me some time. This is a repeating theme in this reality script. How many stories do we have of, oh, during their lifetime, so-and-so's paintings, oh, nobody liked them during their lifetime, or so-and-so's writings weren't appreciated, or so-and-so's music wasn't appreciated. How many of these sob stories that we have, it wasn't appreciated during their lifetime. They were just a loser when they were alive, but then they became famous later. How many times have they recycled that script? I just saw a documentary recently on H.P. Lovecraft the other night. Same thing. Back in the day, he's submitting these stories on Cthulhu and all this stuff. He's getting like the equivalent of today's dollars, like $250 from some creepy tales comic book shop. He's like barely struggling to put ramen noodles on the table. And But today, H.P. Lovecraft, you know, he's just so appreciated, so loved. It's the same, same script. Hated back in the day. Not Okay, not hated. Okay, that, that's wrong for H.P. Lovecraft, of course. But just this little writer in this little tiny genre, some comic book, dark tales that almost nobody read, nobody not famous. He goes from that to today's just a Cthulhu genius. It's the same script. If something isn't loved, it's thrown out. When I do my cat litter, I throw it out. I don't save it, hoping that someday it could be worth something. You know, Van Gogh's paintings... You know, you remember the woman who tossed garbage out the window at Akeem's feet when they finally picked out where they wanted to live in Queens? A country, semi, a country so free you can toss garbage on the street. You could have had the, all the Van Goghs taken out of Akeem's suitcases and tried to offer them for sale to the woman that threw the garbage out at Akeem's feet. She wouldn't have bought them. They all would have been thrown out. A bit of re random ridiculous example. Imagine if Paul McCartney lived in 1650. 1650, not 1960, 15, 1650, Paul McCartney. Now imagine, no pun intended, imagine an opium-addicted Paul of about 85 pounds who hasn't eaten a solid meal in about two years singing Love Me Do along the docks of the, at the port of Shanghai. He's made his way to Shanghai because they're going to appreciate his stuff, Love Me Do. He's now down to 85 pounds. Now the Chinese, they're put up with him. But since he doesn't play their traditional instruments, they don't really give a shit about Love Me Do. Then what if Love Me Do is on the 2020 list of the world's most popular songs and available to download for 99 cents at iTunes? 
you'd say, well, how did that strung out junkies music that nobody see? The point is nobody appreciated at the time he was making it in this example. How did that strung out junkies music make it all the way through history? And now it's coveted. It's sold for 99 cents, but the rights to Love Me Do are like a Van Gogh. They sell for $1 million. I understand it's not the greatest example because Love Me Do was appreciated at the time, but go with it. Okay? It would have needed help. Love Me Do sung on the docks of Shanghai that they said, oh, this shit again. This, this, this wanker from England is singing this shit. The Chinese wouldn't appreciate it. He found he would never – it wouldn't have been carried through time. And this is 1650, not 1960. It would have needed help from, this, from the minions doing what they do for reality itself. It would have needed help. Van Gogh's crap needs help or it's all fake to begin with and they're laughing all the way to the bank. I don't know. They put some painting up on Sotheby's, sell it for a million dollars. They just 3D printed it in the back room about an hour before. I don't know. You get my point. There are hundreds of things like this that either they wouldn't have lasted on their own merit because they weren't appreciated at the time or even if they were great at the time, it would have been awfully hard to carry them through history and preserve them for thousands of years. See what I'm saying? Okay, guys, we're through ancient Greece, and there's a lot more history to cover. We'll see if uh, in the comments if you liked the absolute absurd slapstick approach to covering history. And if you do, I have a lot more written here. I can definitely do more of this. Thanks for listening.